Hello there, historians. Welcome to another of Mr. Beckstrom's screencasts. Today's content is going to be on the downfall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War between the United States and the USSR. So let's get down to it. Uh, first of all, the attached note taker, which you can find a link to in the comments of this video, will have these four questions. I'll pause throughout the video to give you an opportunity to pause the video itself and uh, respond to these questions in time. So this is how the Cold War ended. Um, what we need to consider first is the difference in economic systems between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had a uh, command economy. The command economy is something that's a hallmark of communism. Uh, when the state owns everything, the state makes all decisions about everything. Um, something very common in uh, all totalitarian governments where the government has ultimate power over everything in the society. So everything is owned by the government and the government makes all production decisions and such. Um, since in communism, everyone is supposed to be equal, uh, there were no significant monetary awards for anyone who did better or tried really hard. Um, so in order to get people to try hard in a uh, communist command style economy, um, all of those governments uh, in history, as well as now, uh, rely on quota systems and punishments. Um, when I say a quota system and a punishment, what I mean is, uh, let's say you have a factory. Here's an anecdote from an uh, actual piece of Soviet history. There's a factory that's supposed to produce glass, sheets of glass. Um, and their original quota was to produce a certain number of tons of sheets of glass in every time period, say, per month. Uh, well. In order to produce the most weight of glass possible, this factory produced glass that was way too thick, perhaps even too thick to be seen through uh, very well. And so the regulators in the Soviet economy said, oh, well, we have to change the target. We have to move uh, what they're trying to aim for. So we don't want you to make thick glass. We want you to make as much glass as possible. So they changed the quota from a weight system to a surface area or a total amount of square meters of glass created which then led that factory to retool and do the exact opposite problem, make glass that was so thin that it would break very easily and thereby uh, using less material and stretching out um, their ability to meet their quota. Um, of course, you know, if you're working in a glass factory, who wants to be making unusable or uh, not very good glass? Though, if it was choosing between doing your job well and receiving some kind of government mandated punishment, like a cut in your rations or, you know, a delay in some kind of thing that you wanted to get, like a car or whatever, um, most people would choose their own self-interest first. And that's really the power of capitalism is that it makes use of those people uh, favoring their self-interests. Um, so what I just described to you is something called a perverse incentive. So meeting a quota and a perverse incentive is an economic concept wherein the system is not set up properly and it uh, becomes in people's best interests to do something other than what the central planners in the command economy want them to do. The example that I just gave about the glass factory is one. There's another famous example or tale from the Soviet Union wherein cans of food were uh, measured for their quota by weight. And the factory or one of factories making these cans of food would put lead weights inside of the cans in order to inflate their numbers, in order to meet the quotas, in order to not get punished. But of course, lead in cans of food means lead poisoning, means you know children with brain damage and all that kind of stuff. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so anyhow, perverse incentives are important to understand and poorly designed uh, quota systems can lead to lots of perverse incentives. This is a problem for the Soviets, uh, a big time problem for the Soviet economy. Um, in the capitalist economy, by contrast, the best ideas win out. So in a capitalist economy in which the competition is totally fair, the best ideas win out. And what we see is benefits accruing to the people who try the hardest and the people who have the most entrepreneurial spirit and innovative capacity um, and who learn more and try hard. So uh, in one system, we get perverse incentives galore. In another system, we get um, citizens trying their hardest. So um, it's not hard to then understand why you get differing rates of economic growth and 
Uh, you want to put that together with the nuclear arms race. So I'll show you the rates of economic growth of the Soviet Union in a moment. But the other thing that we want to consider in answering our second question, in fact, if you have not yet, um, pause to answer the first question, and then we'll continue on the second question. Uh, so how did the nuclear arms race and slow economic growth hamper the Soviet Union? Um, so this is a fun little graphic that I like to show. The Hiroshima bomb, you can see right here, uh, the size of this little Hiroshima bomb uh, stacked up next to some of the larger bombs and the largest bomb of all time it was created by the Soviets. They never actually tested the full strength. This is a theoretical 100 megaton test. That says 50 megatons. In fact, uh, I guess this is the size of the bomb that actually did explode. Um, but the actual design of the bomb would have theoretically allowed for an explosion even twice as big as is on this chart. Um, do you see the Tsar Bomba, uh, the kind of mythical, never used in war, of course, weapon that could even, if detonated on their own soil by the Soviets, end all life on Earth due to the radioactive fallout. In fact, a 50 megaton explosion very nearly killed the pilot who dropped the bomb, um, who dropped it from space and was flying away as fast as a fast plane could fly uh, for about 20 minutes before the explosion. The shockwave still almost knocked his plane out of the air. Um, anyhow, it's quite dramatic. Uh, that's just an example that I put forth of the kind of money that was put into the nuclear arms race and other things that the United States and the Soviet Union were doing to contest the Cold War, like espionage and sabotage with their uh, various groups of spies and using their funds to support proxy wars, which my students have learned about previously. Um, the main piece that you should take away from this slide here is that because of the way in which both sides were trying to outspend the other on the nuclear arms race and this uh, the soviet union wanted to kind of keep pace with the united states they were both spending huge amounts on their military but since the soviet economy was growing more slowly the soviets were spending between 12 and 35 percent of the annual production of their entire country on the military and the united states was spending between five and eleven percent um, eleven percent is very high um, five percent is more in line with uh, what happens now um, in modern budgets, it's, you know, in the uh, single digit range. Um, here's a chart to kind of drive home that point about the sluggishly growing Soviet economy. So the huge military spending and the lack of strong uh, try hard economic incentives in the Soviet Union creates this kind of downward slope that we see. Here's the World War II dip. So, and then the downward slope is we, the blue number is like the official Soviet numbers. The red number is what the United States government thought it was. And then the green bar is what um, uh, an economist after the fact um, published what they thought that based upon kind of industrial output and exports and consumption in the Soviet Union that the economic growth actually was. So the economic growth in the Soviet Union was uh, dwindling and is because the military sucked up so much of that money and the economy just wasn't cutting it. So in comes this guy, Mikhail Gorbachev, wearer of the most famous birthmark of all time, right up there on the top of his head. Um, he became what was called the general secretary of the Politburo, uh, which was the governing body of Soviet Russia in 1985. Um, he had some big ideas and big plans. He wanted to revitalize the Soviet economy. He thought that communism could be saved, but that there needed to be a little bit more openness in communism. Um, uh, it says there he was a radical reformer and that the old ways didn't work. And if you remember some of the history that we've studied that you've already studied about the Soviet Union is that the old ways were uh, obedience through fear. Um, fear of the government, most prominently like the gulag, and Stalin and his execution lists and the secret police and all of that stuff, um, but also fear of the outside. Uh, so like fear of the West. So the government not only kept people afraid of 
the government, the government also kept people afraid of the alternative. So people in the Soviet Union were living under vast amounts of fear most of the time. Now, of course, you know, it's not like everyone was just shivering under their blanket the entire time, but there was always the specter of the government or the outsiders looming over you uh, if you're a member of the Soviet Union, especially if you're a non-Russian member of the Soviet Union. So someone who was one of uh, a citizen of one of the satellite states. So still part of the USSR, but also uh, second class when it comes to uh, citizenship in the USSR. Anyhow, um, Gorbachev signaled some of this openness to change um, by working with President Reagan to uh, go back to limiting some of the nuclear proliferation and the buildup of nuclear weapons that had kind of slowed down in the 1970s and then picked up the pace again in the 1980s. Um, Gorbachev's signature policies were called perestroika and glasnost, um, and those were part of what he did when he first came into office in the mid 1980s. Uh, you don't need to know what's what necessarily here, but what you should know uh, when referencing these two things together is that they were economic and political openness, allowing people to have goods from outside of the Soviet Union, allowing people to have the freedom of speech in some cases to even criticize their government, something that would be unthinkable under the totalitarian state of fear. You can see the image here of a crowded opening of the first McDonald's in the Soviet Union from 1990 as kind of a symbol of the uh, Western consumerism invading um, the Eastern Bloc, invading the Soviet Union um, through perestroika. So these two programs um, led to the people of the Soviet Union and its satellite states to finally have enough. It was a little bit like the first crack in a dam. Um, people had been afraid to stand up against their totalitarian government for decades and decades and decades in the USSR. There had been constant reminders of what would happen to you and your family if you did stand up against the evil totalitarian regime in the USSR. Um, so once Gorbachev signaled that you wouldn't automatically be killed for voicing anti-government opinions, the little crack in the dam turned into the whole dam breaking by 1989. The first revolutions had started. 1989 was a year of a wave of revolutions of communist countries rebelling from the Soviet Union. Um, the most famous of these is pictured at right where you see the fall of the Berlin Wall from the end of 1989, November 9th, 1989. And there's some East German soldiers looking through the Berlin Wall at the people who've gathered uh, in West Berlin um, there to kind of see the spectacle and see the wall come down. So these mass protests and strikes for more freedom, more political freedom and more economic freedom um, ended up in the dissolution two years later, December 26th, 1991, uh, the Soviet Union is over. Um, your last question there on the linked note taker is about why it was bloodless. Um, Gorbachev and the opening of the policies of Glasnost and Perestroika created a, a window for people who wanted to get rid of communism and have a more freedom-based form of government, say like a democracy. Um, to stand up against the Soviet Union. There was plenty of people in the military. So Gorbachev, you know, wasn't a hero by any means, but there was plenty of people in the military who wanted to use the full force of the Russian army, the Russian Red Army, to crush all of these uh, late 80s, early 90s movements for independence that had been inspired by economic and political openness of perestroika. Um, but Gorbachev wouldn't have it. He had had enough of the slaughtering of his own people. It's not that he had never used the military to put down movements for independence, but at this point, he decided that he wasn't going to. Um, and once the independence movements were happening, Gorbachev ended up having to step down as president and the USSR was split into 15 different countries. Um, side note, Vladimir Putin was one of these military leaders. He was high up in the KGB and um, it's this historian's opinion that the Cold War is still being fought by Russia um, because of the way in which Putin's career started being deep into the Cold War and not wanting the Cold War to end in the first place. So that's all I have for you today. If you're filling in the note taker, please make sure to complete it by the due date, which uh, for my class is this Sunday at midnight.
Thanks very much. I'll see you soon.